Hello, and welcome to this lesson on synaptic transmission. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe how neurons transmit information to other cells across synapses. This is vital for understanding how the cells of the nervous system communicate with each other and with other target tissues. Let's first begin by saying what a synapse is. A synapse is a site where information can be transmitted from one cell to another. For our purposes, one of those cells will always be a neuron. The second cell can be another neuron or a target cell such as a muscle cell. So there are two ways that information can be transmitted between cells, electrically and chemically. An electrical synapse, which we have here, uses direct current flow between cells. So to accomplish this, uh, the cells use gap junctions, which we have here, uh, which act as conduits for ion flow from one cell to another. So for example, if I had some, let's say, calcium ions in one cell, they can travel directly through these pores, these gap junction pores, into the interior of the other cell. So there's direct transfer of ions, direct transfer of current between the cells. And you can see that here. Some cell types signal this way, such as cardiac and smooth muscle cells. But for the purpose of the MCAT, just know that electrical synapses are one of the types of synapses and that they signal directly between cells. The other type of synapse is a chemical synapse. So this is the major synapse that you should know for the MCAT and in general for biology because it shows up so much in the nervous system. Um, chemical synapses use neurotransmitters to send information between cells. So let's orient ourselves a little bit. So we have two participating cells. We have the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. And then we, uh, we have a space separating them two here called the synaptic cleft. So presynaptic means it's before the synapse, postsynaptic means it's after, and then we have this space. Neurotransmitters, which you can see here, are the chemical bridge that allow the presynaptic cell to talk to the postsynaptic cell across this space. Now that we're familiar with the chemical synapse, let's look at how exactly chemical synapses work. First, we'll need to introduce the players. We have here two neurons, the presynaptic neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, and the synaptic cleft which separates them. At the terminal of the presynaptic neuron, there are two features we should attend to. We have the voltage-gated calcium channels. These are ion channels that are permeable to calcium and open in response to changes in membrane potential. And here we have synaptic vesicles, which are little bundles of neurotransmitter that are stored up in the presynaptic neuron. On the postsynaptic neuron, we have two receptors. We have the ligand-gated ion channel, ligand-gated ion channel, and we have the G protein coupled receptor. These are the two types of uh, neurotransmitter receptor and we'll have much more to say about them later. The black dots in the synaptic cleft are the neurotransmitters themselves. We won't be too concerned with the actual identity of the neurotransmitters right now. There are many, many neurotransmitters, some of which you may already know, such as acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, GABA, and glutamate. All of them, though, use the same general mechanism we're discussing in some form or another. So if you understand this, you know pretty much all you, all you need to know about the, all the neurotransmitters. So this is how it works. An action potential marches down the axon of the presynaptic neuron, and it causes depolarization in the, in the synaptic terminal. That depolarization is the signal that opens the voltage-gated calcium channels. 
that then allows for calcium ions to flow into the cell from the extracellular fluid and accumulate in the presynaptic terminal. Now, this calcium influx causes the, the vesicles to fuse with the membrane in a process called exocytosis, where those vesicles release their neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to whatever receptors are on the postsynaptic neuron. Now, what kind of response are we going to have? Well, the response of the postsynaptic neuron depends on the type of the receptor. For the MCAT, you should know the two types, which we've already alluded to, the ligand-gated ion channel and the G-protein coupled receptor. In the case of the ligand-gated ion channel, the receptor itself is an ion channel. So for example, we have a channel and it has a spot here to bind its ligand. And when that happens, the channel opens up and ions can flow in. So let's say this is sodium. That's what's happening here too. One, one type of receptor that you will probably come across in your MCAT studies is the acetylcholine receptor in the context of uh, muscle contraction. Uh, this is actually a ligand-gated ion channel. Now, with the G-protein coupled receptor, binding of the neurotransmitter doesn't lead to the opening directly of an ion channel, but rather it causes an intracellular signaling cascade, so lots of signaling events, that eventually, indirectly, causes uh, the movement of ions into or out of the cell, just as with the ligand-gated ion channel. With both, the end result of receptor binding is a change in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell. I want you to remember that. In either case, whether it's the ligand-gated ion channel or the G-protein coupled receptor, the end result is a, is a flow of ions and a change in the membrane potential. So the membrane potential can change in two ways. So we have two ways. It can either be excitatory or inhibitory. So in the case of excitatory, this, the, the binding of neurotransmitter leads to a membrane potential change that stimulates the formation of a new action potential. So for example, if this were the acetylcholine receptor, the acetylcholine would bind and lead to the influx of positively charged ions like sodium, and that would cause depolarization in the postsynaptic neuron, and as you know, depolarization would be, in, in, in most cases, sufficient to generate a new action potential. So depolarization, and then we would have a new action potential, and that's how the signal got from here to here. Other neurotransmitters cause inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, and rather than stimulate a new action potential formation, rather they impede the formation of a new action potential. So for example, GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and binds to G-protein coupled receptors, would bind here and lead to intracellular signaling cascade and indirectly lead to the opening of ion channels that rather than depolarize, hyperpolarize the postsynaptic uh, membrane. And that would actually make the formation of a new action potential more difficult. Right? If you remember back to the action potential lesson, hyperpolarization takes you farther from threshold and makes it harder to reach uh, the point where an action potential is going to fire. That's why, that's, call, that's why this whole reaction is called inhibitory. So there you have it. That's, that's really all there is to know about synaptic transition for the MCAT. Mastering this concept will take you a long way and will also help your studies later on if you're ever interested in neuroscience. So with that, good luck and happy studying.